Welcome to our final lecture for week four of the spring semester of 2021 for History 131, American History Since 1877. Uh, this lecture is for February 12th, 2021, and we will shift gears from our discussion on the New South and the establishment of Jim Crow segregation, uh, both politically and socially, that we discussed in the first two lectures of this week. And we'll take a look at capital and labor in the Gilded Age. We'll begin by looking at labor conditions, then examine uh, the various examples of social unrest and the creation and establishment of early labor unions in America and take a look at the strengths and weaknesses of labor unions during the Industrial Revolution, also known as the Gilded Age era. So without further ado, let us take a look at labor conditions in the Gilded Age. Uh, I'll remind you before we discussed the Jim Crow South and the New South, uh, the New South ideal promoted by Henry Grady and the Jim Crow segregation laws that were passed by Southern politicians at the state and local levels in the 1890s. Before we began uh, those lectures, we discussed the industrial age in America in the 1870s, the 1880s, and into the 1890s. And we talked about the robber barons um, in a bit of review. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over uh, that again just a little bit here. Uh, the robber barons, of course, uh, were um, captains of industry, uh, <clears throat> such as John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Southern Rockefeller or S Southern robber barons, I should say, um, such as James Buchanan Duke of North Carolina and Cornelius Vanderbilt as well. But if you remember uh, when we talked about the robber barons, we discussed how these men were shrewd businessmen and also ruthless competitors. They, they didn't just want to make money. They wanted to dominate their industry. And as such, they would do whatever they had to do to gain advantages over the comp competition, push competition out of the way uh, through either vertical integration or horizontal integration, or in the case of Rockefeller and Carnegie, a mix of both. Um, and what that resulted in was the owners of these giant corporations the robber barons themselves earning tremendous income and amassing a great deal of wealth. Also senior level employees within those companies, the upper management types uh, also earned a great deal of money during this time. And the people that were left out were frankly the, the rank and file employees, the ordinary workers that were, uh, working on the railroad tracks or in the steel mills or in the oil refineries, as the case may be, um, in the factories, in the refineries, on the tracks. Those ordinary uh, workers um, were not making much money. They, the jobs were hard, the conditions were hard, um, and the hours were quite long. Um, but just a bit of a review. Uh, in 1890, the wealthiest 1% of Americans owned about a quarter, about 25% of the nation's assets, and the top 10% uh, of Americans in terms of wealth owned over 70% of the nation's assets. So you have a, a great deal of wealth and control being uh, possessed by very few people in America. Um, the rank and file employees, the ordinary workers, if you will, brought home very little money, sometimes as little as 
$1 per day while working long hours in arduous and often dangerous conditions. And when I say long hours, I'm talking about 58, 59, 60-hour work weeks uh, without days off. And um, based on the ebbs and flows of the economy and during these years, they might not be working all the time. They might actually be unemployed for days or weeks at a time. On average, um, your ordinary worker was unemployed about one month out of the year and the other 11 months or so, or 10 and a half months, they were working um, for meager pay, um, long hours and, and often dangerous conditions. Uh, the industry leaders, as I mentioned, uh, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Thomas Ed Edison, and others, uh, subscribe to the theory of social Darwinism uh, promoted by academics such as Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner, and adopted by prominent newspaper columnists such as H.L. Macon. And uh, they used this social Darwinism theory, the, uh, the robber barons did, as a crutch to justify the massive gulf that existed between their incomes and the bulk of their employees' wages. Basically, a survival of the fittest. Those at the top deserve the lion's share of the wealth, and those at the bottom, the weakest uh, members of society, will just have to, to get by and survive on whatever scraps are left over. That's, that was basically their line of thought and they justified it as this is natural selection. This is, this is evolution, human style and corporate style, if you will. Well, as you can imagine, that did not go over well with ordinary workers. Um, they were unhappy with their pay. They were unhappy with the working conditions they wanted to work uh, regular hours for uh, solid, respectable pay and in a working environment where they weren't risking life or injury on a daily basis. So um, one of the first major examples where we see uh, the social unrest develop within the ordinary workers occurs in 1877, uh, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Uh, this was a fledgling labor movement um, of railroad workers in Martinsburg, West Virginia, who simply walked off the job uh, because they were unhappy with their pay and with the working conditions. They blocked the tracks, the railroad tracks where they had been working and they began to destroy property. This spurred similar walkouts and demonstrations uh, along railroad lines across the country. And um, by the end of the Great Railroad Strike, over 100 people were dead and millions of dollars of railroad property had been damaged. Um, the strike ultimately failed um, because there was not much organization. It was, it was an informal strike. It was unorganized, not operated by uh, a, a labor union or the leadership and organization of a labor union. It was just sort of uh, a grassroots strike, for lack of a better term, that sort of picked up um, instantaneously. And um, although it was effective for a while, eventually uh, it, it was um, brought in check by uh, the government and the, and the corporations. So that was the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. But what that strike did uh, was that it demonstrated the potential uh, for uh, power for, for the laborers during this time if they could find a way to organize uh, and try to demand better pay uh, and better working conditions uh, with uh, a strength in numbers and a strength in organization as opposed to just um, randomly striking or walking out on their own and hoping that others would 
learn about it and follow suit. So, um, in the wake of the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, uh, the Knights of Labor uh, becomes a, uh, America's first really uh, prominent labor union. Uh, it was founded in 1869, uh, and it emerged as the preeminent national labor union of after the railroad strike. The, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 by the way, was the first major American work strike in the, the country's history. But as far as the Knights of Labor, it was uh, a union that was uh, very egalitarian. It was open to both skilled and unskilled laborers, including women and racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, at its peak in 1886, the Knights of Labor had more than 700,000 members nationwide. And the organization came up with a set of objectives that they were hoping to accomplish um, through their strength in numbers and through their um, willingness to negotiate. And these are the things that they, they wanted. Um, they wanted a cooperative system, which is owned collectively by all workers. Uh, they wanted an eight hour workday. They wanted an end to child labor. That's another thing um, that I discussed in uh, our previous lectures about um, the rise of industrialism in America is that there were no laws prohibiting child labor at the time. So children, young children uh, could be sent into factories, could be sent to uh, along railroad lines and, and into agricultural um, fields for, for farming and things like that. They, but the Knights of Labor wanted uh, an end to child labor as, as part of their objectives. They also wanted workplace safety laws. They wanted a graduated federal income tax. Uh, they sought public ownership of railroads and telegraph lines and they wanted a government-sanctioned labor organization. And if you can see the um, <clears throat> illustration in the upper left-hand corner of the slide here, you can sort of see what they envision with the eight-hour workday, that you would have eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for what we will, as it says, basically eight hours of leisure time, eight hours of time to to enjoy life without uh, sleeping, apart from sleeping and apart from actually being at work and, and working for your employer. Uh, something that obviously um, is in place today, the eight hour work day, the 40 hour work week, it was not in place when America was founded. It was not in place during uh, the early decades of the industrial age, the Gilded Age. And that was one of the main things that they wanted, uh, an eight-hour workday. So uh, one of the major events that occurred right as the Knights of Labor uh, had really established itself as a, uh, a leading labor union nationwide, uh, there was... Uh, a, uh, a violent incident in Chicago that's known as the Haymarket Affair. Um, let me d begin by discussing um, two of the, the folks involved in this. Uh, Albert and Lucy Parsons, uh, they were an interracial couple from Texas who had relocated to Chicago. Uh, they were anarchists and they believed that any form of government that was aligned with capitalism should be destroyed. And you can see a picture of the Parsons um, in the upper right-hand corner here, Albert on the left and his wife Lucy on the right. Um, there was a strike in Chicago at the McCormick Reaper Works, uh, a Chicago factory, on uh, the 1st of May in 1886. And um, a day or two after that, there was a rally held in Haymarket Square. Um, 
to protest uh, the strike um, that, uh, or to protest the, uh, the the conditions at the factory and the and the low pay. During this this strike or during this rally, I should say, uh, there was a number of speakers, activists who spoke up at the rally and advocated for socialism. Some of them advocated for anarchism. And ultimately, the police arrived to break up the rally. When the police arrived, a confrontation occurred in which a bomb went off. Um, a bomb exploded, killing seven policemen. The police, feeling that they were under attack, responded by opening fire on the crowd and killed four people in the incident. This led to a trial and um, Albert Parsons and seven other men were convicted uh, in the Haymarket bombing. Parsons and three others were executed for their role in the bombing. Lucy Parsons um, was not executed and she um, dedicated the rest of her life um, to activism for um, labor unions and for um, equity uh, for ordinary workers in Chicago, in and around Chicago and elsewhere. Um, the Haymarket Affair uh, produced disastrous results for the Knights of Labor. Uh, this um, event drew national media coverage, newspapers across the country covered it, and the trial uh, sparked outrage amongst many Americans who began to view uh, the union, in this case the Knights of Labor, but unionism in general, as a breeding ground for radicalism and violence. Uh, as a result, membership in the Knights of Labor's in the Knights of Labor declined precipitously following the Haymarket Affair and the push for an eight-hour workday failed. So this one event uh, sparked a, a, a controversial trial and the trial um, and, and the coverage of the trial led to a tremendous decline in uh, public support for the Knights of Labor or labor unions, and ultimately um, that spelled the end of the Knights of Labor. So in the wake of uh, the demise of the, the Knights of Labor, a new uh, national labor union um, came to uh, the forefront in the 1880s, the American Federation of Labor, also known as the AFL. It was founded in the 1880s. It is still around today. Uh, it merged uh, with another labor union, the Congress of Industrial Organizations in uh, the 20th century. And so it is known today as the AFL-CIO, but it was originally the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. And it uh, emerges after the Knights of Labor folds. It is much more moderate overall in its positions and its goals than the Knights of Labor. Uh, originally, the AFL excluded unskilled workers and was also unfriendly to women and racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, this works to, this serves to exacerbate the conflict between skilled and unskilled laborers because the AFL only accepted skilled laborers. Uh, I mentioned the Knights of Labor was very um, kind of open, accepting just about everybody who was a laborer at that time, skilled laborers, unskilled laborers, women, racial minorities, ethnic minorities. The AFL is pretty much open for white men who are uh, skilled laborers. That was basically who they were trying to um, attract to join for their membership. Uh, the AFL believes and promotes in, quote, pure and simple trade unionism, unquote. Uh, the organization quite simply consisted of craft unions categorized by specific skills and specific trades. So you would have a specific craft union like the American 
railroad union, for example, which would be one union that would be under the umbrella of the larger national organization that the American Federation of Labor, that those craft unions were members of the AFL. The AFL is interested only in working conditions and wages. Um, they had no desire to push for massive economic change. Uh, that also distinguishes them from the Knights of Labor. In fact, the AFL um, viewed strikes as a last resort and, and really tried to avoid them uh, unless there really was no other option. Uh, by 1904, the AFL consisted of about 2 million members nationwide. And you can see an early seal of the AFL in the upper uh, right-hand corner. All goods bearing this label are guaranteed to union made, or guaranteed union made, I should say. While the AFL discouraged strikes as uh, an overall principle of their union, labor strikes still occurred in uh, the 1880s and the 1890s and even in the early part of the 20th century. And one of the more um, well-known strikes of the 1890s, a strike that generated national headlines coast to coast, was the Pullman strike, much like um, the Haymarket Affair, a strike that originated in uh, Chicago. Um, in this case, George Pullman is the owner of a business that built luxury railroad cars, and his company had a factory in Chicago. Uh, Pullman um, practiced corporate welfare, um, which was a uh, basically where corporations um, would provide specific perks to their workers in order to avoid strikes and government interferences. Um, company towns where the workers could live um, on the factory grounds and um, live in housing provided by the company. And that in fact was uh, the case with Pullman. A Pullman town was a self-contained town on the site of the Pullman factory for his employees to reside. Of course, they were paying rent to uh, Pullman while they were living there. So uh, he wasn't just doing it out of the, the generosity of his heart. He was uh, trying to make a little more money off them and, and control them as, most, as best as he could, even when they were not on the clock on the job. At the end of 1893, the month of December 1893 and the month of January 1894, Pullman uh, cuts wages across the board to his employees by 25%, uh, yet he refused to lower rents on the Pullman apartments uh, within Pullman Town that, that most of these employees who just had their pay cut by a fourth uh, were living in. Unsurprisingly, the workers were not happy with this turn of events and they wound up striking. Uh, the American Railroad Union, a craft union that was part of the AFL, organized the Pullman strike and uh, Eugene Debs was the, uh, the national leader of the strike. Um, they refused to handle uh, Pullman cars across the country. It becomes National in scope does the strike as it starts in Chicago and spreads to 27 other states and territories in the U.S. And simply put, the, the ARU members refused to, to work with uh, Pullman cars and to handle Pullman cars in the rail stations across the country. And as a result, uh, railroad traffic was ground to a halt. Railroads shut down across the country uh, due to the Pullman strike. Pullman, of course, is dismayed by what is happening to his business, and he appeals to the governor of Illinois, asking the governor uh, 
to send troops in to break up the strike. The governor refused and uh, would not send in the state militia to end the strike. However, Grover Cleveland, uh, then the president of the United States, uh, intervened. Uh, Cleveland ordered the U.S. Army to go to Chicago and break up the strike. Um, 2,000 federal troops restored order and Eugene Debs was jailed and that caused the strike to end with Debs in prison. The, <clears throat> the ARU uh, lacked uh, effective leadership to continue the strike and that caused the end of the strike in 1894. So it took federal intervention um, by the federal government to break this strike. Um, and that was uh, government getting involved in business and getting involved in um, a dispute between capital and labor um, with the Pullman strike of 1894. So as the 19th century drew to a close, uh, there were strengths and weaknesses of labor unions um, that had been uh, demonstrated through the various uh, strikes as well as the various uh, labor unions, first the Knights of Labor, then the AFL that followed suit. Um, first, uh, we'll take a look at the strengths of the, the labor unions. Um, they presented a very clear vision of economic citizenship for ordinary workers. We've talked a lot uh, thus far this semester in this class about citizenship in America. That's one of the big themes of this course as we go through this semester. Um, who deserves citizenship? Who belongs? Who gets citizenship? And we've talked about it with African Americans in the South uh, after the Civil War and Reconstruction with the um, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the right to vote for African-American men, and then how subsequently in the uh, 1890s, uh, the Southern Democrat uh, state politicians that returned to power across the South um, created laws and passed laws that stripped African-American men of the right to vote in many cases or made it substantially more difficult for them to exercise their right to vote. And that's a form of denying the citizenship to the African-Americans. We've talked about uh, the westward expansion and uh, the clashes between white settlers and Native Americans out west, and that was more than just uh, over land and, and resources, but also about citizenship. Do, did Native Americans belong as uh, citizens of the United States? That was an issue that was um, being um, discussed and, and challenged, frankly, um, throughout uh, the, the latter part of the 19th century. And with regard to ordinary workers, laborers, economic citizenship, they, they had the right to vote in elections, so they could participate in the political process, but how do you uh, fight for your right for fairer wages and for safer working conditions and more reasonable uh, hours against behemoth corporations and the owners of those corporations who have an unbelievable amount of resources at their disposal, um, both in business and uh, with uh, the government, um, the federal government, to try to quell um, your demands. And so that was something that labor unions um, did was they organized laborers and, and came up with ob specific objectives, a clear vision of economic citizenship to strive for going forward. They also um, 
sought cooperation among workers, the AFL bringing craft unions of skilled laborers across the country, albeit limited to skilled laborers, limited to uh, white men. And before that, the Knights of Labor, um, which was even more open and uh, allowed unskilled and skilled laborers, as well as women and racial and ethnic minorities, in addition to just white men. Uh, labor unions argued for the tempering of free market capitalism. Uh, they wanted to uh, put some sort of uh, guidelines in place so that uh, industry leaders couldn't just run roughshod over uh, their workforce. They wanted government intervention on behalf of workers occasionally in certain situations, but they wanted that to be an option. And they wanted to uh, you know, fight in general for uh, the rights of ordinary workers to organize, to work in a safe environment, and to protest if they felt that their rights were being violated, if their uh, right, their economic citizenship in any way, shape, or form was being violated. So that was the strengths, was that the labor unions sort of brought together these objectives and under an, a clear um, set of goals and presented that, fought for that, argued uh, for those goals uh, publicly uh, and, and, and clearly. But there were weaknesses as well. And the weaknesses of organized labor during this era uh, are as follows. Uh, there were divisions between skilled and unskilled laborers, uh, different kinds of jobs, different kinds of skill sets. Um, we talked a little bit earlier um, this semester about how in the rise of industrial America and with these giant corporations such as Rockefeller's uh, oil empire and Carnegie's steel empire, uh, that one of the things that they uh, were able to do to, <clears throat> to grow at such an exponential rate was to uh, figure out ways to use the technological mechanical advancements in mass produce uh, mass produce the goods and the products that they were bringing to market and so as a result they relied on a lot of unskilled laborers and individual laborers were basically interchangeable and that hurt them from a leverage standpoint skilled laborers on the other hand um, had specific training, specific skills to perform specific tasks and, and jobs, and they were more valuable within uh, certain industries that relied heavily on skilled labor. The Knights of Labor wanted to unite skilled laborers and unskilled laborers uh, together under the same union umbrella, if you will, but the AFL, which succeeded the Knights of Labor, um, exclusively sought um, the uh, membership of skilled laborers and blocked unskilled laborers from joining. That exacerbates it, an already existing tension and division between skilled and unskilled laborers, and that hurts the um, ordinary workers from being able to be um, more united and, and more powerful in their demands. There were also divisions uh, along racial, ethnic, and gender lines. Um, I mentioned the Knights of Labor was welcoming to women laborers as well as to laborers from various racial and ethnic minority groups. The AFL, which succeeded the Knights of Labor, um, basically uh, did not seek members from um, different racial and ethnic uh, groups, nor did they seek women. They were pretty much trying to attract and retain the, the membership of white men. Uh, there was no unity with the agrarian movement. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the agrarian movement next week. Uh, but while there was economic anxiety amongst um, 
industrial workers in uh, the major cities in America, like Chicago and New York, and and everywhere where there were uh, fe- large factories and mass production of goods, um, there was an agrarian movement that was taking place at the same time as farmers felt uh, squeezed by uh, railroads. And um, again, uh, we'll, we'll go into that in much further detail next week, but there was no unity between uh, the labor unions of the industrial organizations with uh, the uh, rank and file ordinary American farmers. Uh, there was the one thing they had in common was they were American citizens who were experiencing great a great deal of economic anxiety, but um, they did not unite and try to uh, become stronger as one unit um, to go against uh, the railroads as well as um, <clears throat> the uh, captains of industry that that more or less ran industrial America at this time. And as a result of these weaknesses, the ultimate outcome was that the labor unions could not overcome the power of corporations and the government. And even in a case like the Pullman strike, where uh, they, the AFL and, and the American Railroad Union uh, you know, was fortunate to have a, a sympathetic uh, supporter in the person of the governor of Illinois, who refused to uh, send in the state militia to break up the union. Pullman instead appealed to the president of the United States, Grover Cleveland, who uh, quickly sent in the federal troops, the U.S. Army, to break up the union. So uh, the combination of these large uh, corporations as well as federal government cooperation uh, really, really... um, was too much of an obstacle for uh, these fledgling labor unions uh, to overcome both the Knights of Labor as well as the AFL, um, the American Federation of Labors. So uh, that will wrap up our discussion and our week of lectures for week four, and we will pick up again with a lecture on Monday and discuss uh, some of the um, economic anxiety that farmers and uh, um, agricultural workers were facing during this same period, the late 1880s and the late in the 1890s. And as the week goes on, we'll discuss the progressive era, era as well, the coming of the progressive era as well. Have a great weekend, and don't forget, um, Thursday of next week, February 18th, uh, is the due date for primary source analysis assignment number one. It is on Blackboard under the content section. Uh, You also receive the assignment um, as an attachment in in an email that I sent uh, a couple of days ago, Uh, but that's due uh, Thursday of next week. So you got six days to do it. Um, Just a friendly reminder. Have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you again on Monday.